appreciate it to each and every one of you who appreciate a great glass of wine. You know what I mean? It's Monday. Let's raise a glass to the beginning of another week. It's time to unscrew, uncork, or savor a bottle. And let's begin exploring the wine glass. Today, I am so honored to share my conversation with the amazing Natalie McLean. If you are a wine lover, then you know her name. What you may not know is that Natalie actually attended Oxford and studied romantic poetry. You may know that she has won the James Beard an unprecedented four times. But did you know she also won awards for Highland Dancing? Natalie's story is so compelling that the hour just flew by and before I knew it, we were way over our normal conversation time. So I decided to break the conversation up into two separate episodes. I know you're going to enjoy the conversation as much as I did and be sure to come back next week for the second half. While you're listening, please take a moment to rate and review Exploring the Wine Glass. Ratings are now available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Audible. Taking one minute of your time is the only way the algorithms will suggest exploring the wine glass to others. Slancha. Hey everybody, I'm Lori Budd, a UC Davis winemaking program, Som Day service, champagne specialist, and WSET level two graduate. You can find Exploring the Wine Glass on all the socials, as well as your favorite podcast catchers. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's the perfect time to swipe, subscribe, rate, and review. I promise I'll never tell you what to drink, but I'll always share what's in my glass. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Allure of the Poor, sponsored by Dracaena Wines. I am your host, Lori. I am a WSET Level 2 graduate, UC Davis winemaking graduate, champagne specialist, Cote de Rome specialist, and I'm probably forgetting something, but I don't know. All that really matters is that you drink and you enjoy it. And today, I am very honored to have a very special guest, Natalie McLean from up north. So welcome, Natalie. How are you? <laughs> it's great to be here, Lori. I'm sure it's a lot warmer where you are, but uh, wine will keep us warm. <laughs> Wine will keep us warm. And sadly enough, we just got an Amazon alert that we are going into a freeze um, warning for the next Ooh. three days. So I don't know if it's warmer or not, but <laughs> it's, whoa, I, like when that alert comes off on Amazon, I, I'm like, hello, hello, are you sure you're talking about the right area? Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, but luckily we have wine and it will keep us warm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So I, again, I am so honored to have you on Thank the you. podcast. My pleasure. Um, you know, I, I think anybody who thinks wine, your name comes up synonymously <laughs> with it, whether they're up north in Canada or in the United States, we are, I mean, it's, it must be a kind of an incredible feeling to be so recognized with wine. Like it must feel like quite the accomplishment first of all right well thank you the, i feel like um you know sometimes uh, as a big fish swimming in a very tiny pond in terms of <laughs> wine lovers are a very specific group but i love them they're my people you're my people of course Lori. <laughs> but uh no over time i i just loved connecting with people in all the different ways that we can these days whether it's online or through books or whatever that's my jam that is awesome and we're going to get into wine obviously but before we get into wine, I just have to ask, you actually studied romantic poets at Oxford. So like that is, I mean, almost a 180 from, <laughs> from wine, right? You know, so how did, how did you get into romantic poets? And then we have to know who your favorite poet is. Okay, absolutely. So hands down, it was John Keats. Um, and I have a story about him, Lori, that will actually magically tie together the romantic poets and wine. So <laughs> this is from my uh, memoir that I'm currently writing, but I'd love to share it with you if you're good with that. Yeah. All right. Okay. So several years ago, I was on a walking tour of Rome's uh, lesser known food haunts with my partner, Miles, and my son. And I was thrilled when we accidentally came across Keats's burial place. And his tombstone was tucked away in a remote um, corner of this graveyard, and it was inscribed with his quote, Ode to a Grecian Urn. Uh, that's the one he's best known for, I think. Beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That is all you need to know on earth and all you 
you need to know or something like that. I'm mangling him even so. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, and so, you know, call me morbid, but I think walking through a graveyard on our way to a cheese shop made perfect sense because we were blending life and death and eating and satiation. Um, so I, I adopted in my uh, first two books and in my writing, I adopted kind of the new journalism approach to writing. So what they believed, like uh, Joan Didion and uh, Truman Capote, was do the thing you write about. And so instead of interviewing a sommelier, I became one for a night, you know, so that I could get a deeper, richer experience to write about. You know, I worked in a wine store, I worked the harvest, and we could talk more about that later. But my earliest inspiration, Lori, was actually Keats because his work um, was the subject of my final paper at Oxford and particularly his belief in what he called negative capability. So he tried to forget himself and become one with his subject, like, like the urn. And he was trying to capture that pure experience in words. So truth for him was the was the urn's beauty itself, not some cold, distant, objective analysis of the urn. And so mm -hmm. I really resonated with that. Like, when I talk about my love of wine, um, it's not an analysis of it. I really want to lose myself in, in my subject and capture that feeling that wine gives us into words and yet not reduce it down to fruit salad and a number. So, so I'll wrap this long winded story up. Uh, the heartbreaker was that Keats didn't want his name on his tombstone. He felt that he had contributed nothing to the world before he died at just 25 years old from Berkeley tuberculosis TB. And also on his tombstone, he wrote, here lies one whose name was writ in water. It was really melancholy sentiment because he thought everyone would forget about him. And that inspired me to draft my own tombstone inscription, Lori. Here lies one in time whose name shall be consumed with wine. <laughs> <laughs> so several decades later, Keats' good friend Joseph Severin died, and he arranged for his tombstone to be placed next to Keats to indicate that the nameless tombstone beside him belonged to the immortal English poet, ensuring that future generations would know Keats's burial place. And all I can say is, would that we all had a good friend who, who will remember us and with whom we can share a good glass of wine. Oh, that is, that is the best tie-in story <laughs> ever. That is truly the best tie-in story oh, ever. Oh, thanks. Thought it was a stretch, but I tried to <clears throat> lasso them together. Yep. <laughs> and by the way, Going through cemeteries is actually one of my favorite things to do whenever we go, um, whenever we go away to to Europe or mostly Europe because they're just more beautiful there. There's something beautiful about them. Um, but there's some areas here in the United States that just have, you know, the older cemeteries. And do you know there's a term for cemetery lover without yes, being a weird? There is a ta it is a tapophile. A tapophile. And, well, and it's this, somebody. What's the origin? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I don't know what the origin is. Um, I found that out when we went to Scotland. And oh. um, we were, you know, there's the amazing, um, beautiful cemeteries there. Um, and uh, we were going through them all. And we do. We we travel all over. We, we were in Rome. We were going through the cemeteries looking for the famous people and just walking through them because there's something peaceful about them and and really they're beautiful they're they're you know they're elegant they're beautiful and to you think about what these people's lives were like so it's kind yes. of like a reflection on even though i don't know who you are you know i'm i'm appreciating you as a person because i'm taking time to look at your stone you know absolutely and, and yeah. there's another new term that you might like, um, hobbyists who go and visit grave graveyards. It's called graving. And there's a whole tourism oh. industry getting built up around graving. So we're off to a morbid start here. But I think it's a perfect combination with wine because there's something immortal about wine. There's something you always remember where you were with a memorable bottle. Absolutely. And I just love, you know, like the t I visited Evita's tombstone when I went to Buenos Aires to write about Argentine wine. Wow. And, yeah, I loved it. And there were very vicious cats around, <laughs> hungry cats surrounding <laughs> her tombstone. Um, you couldn't get too close. But, um, you know, I visited grave uh, graveyards even when 
I was on assignment for something completely different and didn't write about it. But I love seeing it's it's a little heartbreaking, but sometimes the tiny tombstones of children mm -hmm. and they're right beside their families. And there's a story there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. I agree. And I, I don't know, people, some of my friends are like, that's a little strange. And you go to cemeteries and I'm like, just try it. It's yeah. it really is an amazing feeling you I, I think you get to get a sense of those people who were there and and doing you know trying to sense how they were and what they're and you're right the families are all around it yeah but and it's, yeah. it's a reminder of our own mortality i don't think it's morbid at all it's like carpe diem seize the yeah. day you're on top of the ground now but soon you'll join us <laughs> absolutely so, right. like live life uh, you know life's too yeah. short for a bad bottle of wine etc yeah. Exactly, exactly. And that is so true, right? And that goes to my saying of, I will never tell you what to drink, but I'll always share what's in my glass, right? Yes. If you like the wine, drink it. And Amen. if it's in my glass, it will be in your glass too, if you want it. <laughs> That's a great approach, Lori. <laughs> so um, again, I, I I was blown away, you know, I say all the time that I, you know, I'm like the little Googler and I'm like, you know, stalking the person when I go to interview them. But I find out these cool things that I'm like, okay, we have to talk about this. Highland dancing. Mm. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> God. I absolutely love it. So oh, they're bagpipes and me, like it's, it's such an amazing sound. It goosebumps everything yeah so how did you get into that <laughs> well you say bagpipes that brings back another story for me um i was interviewed um, by a local radio reporter at a highland games when i was about nine years old and he said you must really like the sound of ba bagpipes eh and I said, no, they sound like cats screaming, back to cats. Um, <laughs> I, I practice with Whitney Houston at home, Whitney Houston music. So, but I think my, my stance on bagpipe music has softened since then. It was just probably yeah. way too loud, but I'm with you. When I listen to like Paul McCartney's Mull of Kintyre, I can't help but tear up. It's just so beautiful, but they need to be in a distance. <laughs> Not they can right be, up the side they can be pure. If you're right there, and they're right there when you're dancing. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and you're under stress. So it's probably some sort of psychosomatic association I have with bagpipes and competing. But Highland dancing gave me the gifts of focus and discipline and, you know, a maniacal work ethic. So I'll forever be grateful to having done that for, I guess it was close to 18 years and then i opened a dance school when i was younger so um wow. and that got me through university so it was it gave me many gifts uh, it I, it's such a unique form of dancing and you know it's i i don't know it's repetitive but not in a in a bad way like you, you get as viewer because i don't do it but as a viewer you get lulled in and you just start like looking and i don't know again with the bagpipes there it just resonates with me it goes more so than i think any other instrument hmm. it that, gets to the soul you're, you're back on the stage <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is true <laughs> i right into your ear directly that is but, true i can yeah. i can give you that i can give you that <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now that we're done with that part, we could actually get into the wine. My story, I always need to know the origin story. So how did you find your way to wine or how did wine find you? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. So um, after I uh, met my husband at the, uh, we both did the same MBA program. <laughs> we moved to Toronto and um, we wanted to find something to do as a couple in the evenings. He was um, on uh, Bay Street, which is our equivalent to Wall Street. I worked at mm -hmm. Procter & Gamble, like Crisco and Duncan Hines and Pringles. <laughs> um, so we worked long hours and we wanted to find something after work we could do together. And so at first we tried Spanish lessons and, you know, conjugating verbs after a long day at work was just a no-go. Uh, I don't even, I would like to be able to say the Spanish equivalent of no go, no va or whatever. Yeah, no va. Remember. no va. No va. Okay. okay, so one thing stuck with us, stuck with me there. Um, we also tried golf, but for type A personalities with long iron clubs in hand, that was not a good formula either. Uh, we just got <laughs> so frustrated and stressed out. But then I, I saw in this um, brochure that came to our house a wine course. So we could take a wine course 
at night, I thought, yes, we can drink for sure. And that'll be relaxing. And, you know, we, we both loved wine. We knew nothing about it. So we enrolled in this wine course and it was so much fun. But I remember the first night they poured like, I don't know, um, seven samples of only an ounce or two. But like, you know, I'd had a long day at work, so I just knock them all back. And, uh, you know, the equivalent of a glass or whatever it would have been. And then I looked around, saw no one else was doing that. It was so embarrassed. <laughs> it was like my introduction to tasting, not drinking. <laughs> Slow down. But anyway, we loved it. I continued on and completed a, sommel a sommelier certificate uh, program. Um, and uh, my husband did not, but he just, you know, defaulted to me on the wine choices after that. That's fantastic. And I think that's so what brings a lot of couples together. Mm -hmm. is drinking, you know, over wine or whiskey or whatever it is. It's because you're sitting down and it's a, it's something that you're sharing between you that is yes. exactly the same. Yes. But and it slows you down. Yeah. It slows you down. It gives you something to talk about. And even though it's the same exact wine that's in your glass, you have different perspectives and exactly. of what it is. And you're, it's not a, I, I say blue and you say orange. So we're going to argue over it. It's <laughs> like, you know, it's like, Oh really? I think yeah. it's more of this field or I think it's red fruit. It's a strawberry. No, I think it's a cherry. Okay. We can agree with that. <laughs> exactly. And then you can get into food pairings or whatever, or <clears throat> memorable bottles from where you travel. Oh, those uh, come back to me immediately because as you know, smell and taste are directly tied yes. to memory and emotion. And so I will remember the first time we had, you know, a certain bottle and um, it seems weird sometimes <laughs> that that comes back immediately, but I don't think so. With the way our brains are, are wired, it's for me, it's easy to remember exactly the first time I had certain wines. Right. Absolutely. And we have a little display, um, if you can call it that, of those memorable wines, the bottles, you know, and when you look at that bottle, it brings back that memory of instantaneous, yes. right? Exactly. You remember where you were, the context. I remember what we were wearing, you know, the food we were eating, where we were sitting, say, in a restaurant. Anyway, okay. <laughs> just all So involved. that actually leads right into my next question is give a story of one of your most memorable wines and, you know, why why it was so memorable. What about it? Sure, sure. This is um, a memory from my first book, uh, Red, White, and Drunk All Over. Uh, so I had the privilege of visiting the Champagne House Louis Roterer. Um, and they make Cristal, which is beautiful, beautiful top-notch champagne. So I remember sitting in this elegant drawing room, and I, you know, there was burgundy uh, brocade, like burgundy velvet drapes and brocade ropes and all the rest of it. And I stared really thirstily at the bottle of 1995 Cristal that my host was opening. And she said, I'm so glad you came to visit because we don't get to drink Cristal very often because Cristal is on allocation. Every bottle is sold before it's shipped. And it's a, it's um, kind of a favorite bubbly dating back to like the emperor um, Alexander the Tsar of Russia in 1837 to rap stars like Jay-Z who's mentioned it in some of his songs. So it, it has a long history and it's very coveted. And now a word from our sponsor. Exploring the Wine Glass is brought to you by Dracaena Wines. Dracaena Wines is an artisan winery located in Paso Robles, California. They have been producing wine since 2013. Their first vintage began with one wine, their classic Cabernet Franc, which received a 91 in Wine Enthusiast. Since then, they have increased production as well as expanded their portfolio, have received many accolades, including multiple double gold medals and consistent 90-plus ratings. Visit their website, www.dracinawines.com, or use the link in the show notes to schedule a private tasting and to see their entire portfolio. Purchase your award-winning wine and let Dracaena Wines help turn your moments into great memories. But I think like the way we enjoyed it, champagne is the drink of celebration, you know, weddings, birthdays and so on. But it's also for me a very intimate ritual that that can transport you to a very, very private world. And I, I just loved it. I felt that way as we were 
as we were sipping on our Cristal, um, there was <laughs> an adagio of the senses is kind of what I, I wrote about in Red, White and Drunk All Over. So there was that cold sweating bottle, the glinting sem stemware, the frothy pour, the small wrist action of raising the glass and that sort of ocean spritz on your face and then the mouth filling flavor. And I just remember thinking, Oh, I'm I, drooling. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so am I. I'm kind of slabbering. We're gonna... <laughs> um, I, but I remember raising the glass to my lips and thinking, I am breathing in earth and sky here. And, you know, the aromas were like pastry wrapped pears and honey and spice. And they sort of burst like little mm. beads in my mouth from the bubbles. And, you know, long after I swallowed, I could still feel those sort of ghostly bubbles tickling the roof of my mouth. And I actually wanted to lick my glass when it was empty, but I thought that's just undignified behavior, Nat, in the presence of this beautiful champagne. So control yourself. Anyway, it was beautiful, <laughs> just a beautiful experience. <laughs> you mean this isn't like the, the spinner of a chocolate cake? You know? <laughs> no, no, exactly. <laughs> so, that's amazing. Uh, <clears throat> That is amazing. Um, I have not had that pleasure of tasting Cristal, um, but that's interesting. I didn't know every bottle was sold before it was even produced. That's a nice situation to be in. Oh, yeah. It's great if you're collecting the money. Um, but, you know, that I don't know what they sell for um, because that was my first and last experience of Cristal, it's, but it's it's probably close to, it's somewhere between $500 and $1,000 a bottle, something like yeah. that. It's crazy. It's just crazy. Yeah, that. Yeah. But you know what? When you have the money, it, yeah. why not? Sure. Or <laughs> why if someone's not? pouring it for you, absolutely. Of yeah, so absolutely. Have a second glass. In 1995, that is my, that's my husband's and my wedding anniversary is oh, 1995. So lovely. I am always on a mission to find 1995 wines, mm. so that when we have an anniversary, I can open a bottle of 1995 wine. Oh, that's a great but, idea. Um, I don't think I can. I think I think I'll get divorced if I bring that bottle and he realizes how much. It costs. <laughs> oh, this old thing! I've had yeah. this for a long time. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Don't worry, don't worry <laughs> yeah. about it. Don't worry about it. Don't. Good <laughs> <seller>. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so earlier, you had said that you follow in like Keats's theory of be as opposed to observe. All right. So you are actually an accredited sommelier a wine writer, a wine speaker, a judge, uh, you do this podcast, you, I mean, you really do have your hands in everything. So is there one aspect of the, of what you do that you actually like better than others? I think writing itself will always be my first love, even though I came to it last. So I took all those sommelier courses first without even uh, thinking I could be paid to write. It was a confidence thing. So I was in yeah. marketing and, you know, I loved writing customer success stories, but I never thought, hey, you love this part of your job so much. Why not try to make it a full time thing? And, you know, so I hosted wine tastings after I got more confidence. But, you know, eventually I got there. I was on maternity leave and, you know, I pitched a local magazine about wine on the Internet when that was actually a story angle. Um, and that led me to other columns and articles and gave me the confidence to say, hey, I can do this full time. Um, but now the books I read and the courses I take, they're all focused on the craft of writing. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you feel about the, the confidence. Uh, I am I'm type B as type B can be. Um, <clears throat> so. And I'm a Sagittarius, so like I am meant to be in the spotlight. Like that is where I enjoy being. Um, but I, it's it's a difficult thing to pitch an article. Like I am just getting into the freelance thing, and it's kind of disheartening. You know, you ha you have this idea, you pitch it, and then crickets. You hear yeah. you hear nothing. You yes. know, or um, you they they accept the article. <laughs> And then would you think, uh, I'm a, I think I'm a decent writer. Everybody tells me I'm a decent writer. And then it comes back with like, edit this, edit this, edit this, you know, yeah. and it takes a little of a, of a hard shell to not take it personally. Um, but I, I understand that I am 
just getting into that freelance and knowing how to, which I don't know yet, but knowing how to pitch and get the articles to the magazines that, that I want them or that I think they should be in or whatever. So absolutely. It is a, an ego shrinking <laughs> profession <clears throat> to try to write and to keep pitching and no one sees how many times you go up to bat and you're just rejected or crickets or whatever, right. you know, but you just, you, I mean, I, I guess it's just the same sort of pathological optimism that some winemakers have. You just keep going and going yep. and going and trying and pitching and pitching. <laughs> yeah. And it's yeah. funny because on that realm, I'm quite okay with that. Like I get everybody's not going to love our wine. You know, when you, when you go to pour their bottle, it's always exciting to see their faces. You know, and if we're out at a restaurant and somebody has our wine, forget it. Like I don't, I, I will still be, if I'm alive at a hundred years old and I'm still making wine, if somebody's drinking my wine out, I will be, you know, ecstatic, but you pour the wine, not everybody, you know, not everybody's going to buy that wine that, that yes. you make. And it, it is, you know, you go to, you go to a restaurant and they're like, nah, it's just not for our wine list. Okay. It's okay. So I have a thick skin for that. It's, I just got to move that over to the writing aspect yeah, now. <laughs> exactly. It's, yeah, it's a challenge. When when writing is so much a part of us, like it's mm. it comes from inside, just like dance does. I, I find they're very similar when you're trying to express yourself in a different way than just talking directly on the page or on the dance floor. But it's very personal. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. you're really kind of pouring your soul into into what you're writing. And you know, it's, it's a different form of blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> it is. It is. Absolutely, Lori. Yeah. All right. So, well, you obviously write very well because you are, uh, we won the world's best wine writer by the World Food Media Awards in Australia. So, first of all, super kudos. Thank you. All right. Congratulations. And But, like, tell us about that experience. Like, how did you like enter were you like i guess i'll enter what do you like uh -huh. work us through that and then finding out that you won this incredible award um well i used to enter every type of contest as a kid i, I think it was the highland dancing that got me going but you know a coloring contest i'm in you know my secret <laughs> weapon by the way was glitter glue oh just, oh yeah oh yeah that yeah i won many tickets to movies with glitter glue um so <laughs> i i find it hard to resist a, a contest if i feel like i can enter i of course i never think i'm going to win but i, I will go up to bat um but for this one i was on assignment with air canada our major airline and that was a that was a good gig so they they fly you first class when you're writing for their airline magazine so i my assignment Oh, I have to put that in the background. Hey, United, knock, knock, knock. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So uh, they flew me to Australia, and I was to go to all the restaurants, the top restaurants in Sydney, and eat my heart out, drink my heart out, and write about them, and then go down to the Hunter Valley, which is only about an hour away, and write about that wine region. And so um, when I found out I was nominated, um, I was able to coordinate the trip because the, the the award ceremony was in Adelaide. I had to fly from Sydney to Adelaide. But it was surreal because, um, you know, across all of the categories for the World Food Media Awards, there were about a thousand entries. And in the world's best drinks journalist category, um, there was an international panel of magazine newspaper editors who had shortlisted nominees um, that included Gerald Asher, who at the time was writing for Gourmet Magazine. Um, Tim Atkin was with the Observer oh. newspaper in England. Some of my favorite writers, Chris Orr with Decanter Magazine, Huon Hoke with the Sydney Morning Herald. So it was like, okay, I'm here anyway. I'm just going to go because it'll probably be very glamorous and they'll probably be serving some good food and wine. So, <laughs> um, so that night, um, you know, when they, they announced my name, I was sitting beside uh, a food journalist, Lucy Waverman, and I, I literally asked her, did they say my name? <laughs> and it was like, because you know, imposter syndrome, anyone? Because <laughs> I thought, I'm not going to go running down there like an idiot just because I think I heard they, them say my name. <laughs> and she said, yes, get up. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, you know, that that just gave me so much confidence because at that point I had only been writing about wine for about three years. So um, that gave me the confidence to enter like the James Beard and so on. And the point 
I think of some of these writing competitions is, I mean, it's, it's a nice ego boost, but I, I think like the Highland dancing competitions, it's yet another motivator for me to continue to refine my craft of writing. So there's, there's, there's just the joy of writing and that's the internal motivator, but these external motivators are, they help too. So, um, at least that's the way I look at them. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. I, I that's so funny. I could envision you. Wait, wait, no. Did they really just say my name? Really? <laughs> she, no, 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 no. Like, no, 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 no. Get up. <laughs> no, no, no. They yeah. couldn't have. <laughs> no. I know. I said. Yeah. That is <laughs> that's that is awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna have to check out uh, United and see. Uh, yes. What a what a gig. How, were that they just advertising? <laughs> Do they just? <laughs> yeah, you you find the editor, whoever the. Okay. Uh, main well, I'm on there enough. <laughs> hold pitch and yeah, and sort of look through if their archives of their articles are online, like especially food and drink. Take a look at what they've done because obviously you don't want to pitch what they've recently right. done, but something, a unique angle somewhere um, that obviously mm. has a big, big travel angle. They want to yeah. encourage people to travel Ooh. to these places. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> they're trying They're trying to rebuild up Europe now because of the pandemic, right? Right. I'm all for getting there. I'm all there for that. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Get in there, Lori. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Mental note there. Mental note. <laughs> yes. Well, not only are you an award-winning wine writer in terms of articles and things like that, but you've written two books. And the first book, you mentioned it earlier, but I absolutely love the name, Red, White, and Drunk All Over, A Wine-Soaked Journey from Grape to Glass. Mm-hmm. I and take my su- subject very seriously. Yes. Job, <laughs> yes, you title. do. <laughs> I absolutely, you know what? I I love it. It's it's fantastic. It is fantastic. You. And so you're actually, you know, and the research for these books must have been so torturous. You were in Burgundy and Champagne. No you, little uh, tiny sympathy violins. Yeah. You know, no you were you were harvesting with Randall Graham. I, I mean, know. the research. <laughs> <laughs> the research must have been torturous. So, you know, ch- tell us how torturous it was to, to oh. for that research for this book. I, I don't know how I can begin to. So with Rond- Rondell Graham at Bonnie Dune Winery in Santa Cruz, as I mentioned, I like Day in the Life. So George Plimpton was another uh, new journalism journalist. So instead of reporting on football, he played in the NFL to write a book about it. <laughs> So I'm following the sort of vibe of these crazy cats. And I asked Randall if I could come help with the harvest. And he said, sure. Uh, The (laughs) thing about Randall is um, he kind of approaches winemaking like performance art. So he is posed in a purple silk cape and mask as the Roan Ranger for the cover of Wine Spectator magazine. He actually hosted a funeral service for cork in Grand Central Station in New York. It was a coffin, an open coffin filled with cork. And they had a eulogy and all the food was black and they paired wine with it and it was crazy. So this guy is, he's not, but he's not a nutcase. <laughs> he, no, he, he is not. No, no. <laughs> he's so smart. He's, he's written some books. He's witty as heck. And I think he really cracks through um, and gets his message across, you know, uh, his influence, I think, on American wine has been profound, and it's as deep as it is wide, because um, he has been an advocate for less fashionable gra- grapes, experimental winemaking techniques, of course, unconventional marketing when it comes to wine, mm-hmm. and levity, I think, importantly, mm-hmm. in, a, in a business that can take itself too seriously. So I went out there, I wanted the full experience, so he said, great carry the spit bucket and uh (laughs) so we did the tank samples and then he got me hauling hoses and and later that day we were visiting vineyards i mean it was like like a nine or ten hour day Um, i spent a few days there with him and i was picking grapes and it was the sun was just baking but it was giving me a sense a little bit more of an internal sense of what it's like through the harvest and what makes for good wine like when are the grapes right how do you taste that and so all of these things came out in that experience even though it's a bit uh, zany as well (laughs) yeah he um i love him i think he is he is brilliant beyond brilliant and um the things he does are well 
well-conceived in his brain. He knows what that outcome is going to be from from that, what he's going to do. And yeah, he's not crazy at all. He, he no, is beyond brilliant. Yeah. And I love how much dedication he does to the research um, and to, like you were saying, the underappreciated grapes and things like that. It's he really has helped the wine industry as a whole in in such a such an amazing way. He has. Um, yeah. And the research must must have been uh, not too bad because the book was chosen the best wine literature book. So another award for you. So how to like you just keep racking them up. Do you have a room of all these awards? No, no. <laughs> They're all in a box somewhere downstairs. It's like we moved. It's like I am not putting these things up again. It's just like it's a lot. Of... Anyway, no, but it, it's yeah, it's. It... It's gratifying, but again, it's the, the other thing too that competition can do is spread the word. So when you, mm. you know, publishing a book these days is a slog, I'll tell you, like <laughs> um, not looking for pity. The research is fun, but actually trying to sell a book um, is very difficult. Like publishers don't have a marketing budget anymore. Book tours are a thing of the past. They, they either don't have the budget or, you know, COVID did away with that. So I'm in the process of writing my third book, which is a memoir quite different from the first two. Mm -hmm. And these awards can help spread the word about a book, just like, you know, the Oscars do about movies. Right. They get a spike in, in sales or ticket box office. Um, th they're very useful as marketing tools as well these days. And the, um, the whole publishing thing I get, like, it's, I, I think books have, uh, sadly, have fallen by the wayside of, of, I don't know how it is in Canada, but in America, it seems, you know, um, first of all, it went to Kindle, which I don't even, or, you know, to the, I call everything a Kindle, even <laughs> though it's not really a Kindle. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I've got to ask you, as as an author, how do you feel about that, like, uh, paper in your hand versus the electronic? Do you have a preference as, since you are the author? Well, I love paper books. Um, I almost used to think of ebooks, whether they're on tablets or Kindles or wherever, are not real books. Um, but, you know, and how do you sign a Kindle? Book signing <laughs> like, really don't work well. <laughs> let, let me get a marker on your device yeah. there. But, but the, the format that I increasingly love best, Lori, are audiobooks because, of course, you and I are audio people, we have podcasts. Um, so I just, the thing, the format that gets me most excited, especially for this upcoming memoir is audio, because I think it's such an intimate medium with the voice and, you know, we co-create the theater of the mind, you know, where, right. as we read and I don't know, I think there's something there that goes back to childhood and being read stories by your parents that evokes that sort of closeness and that coziness. So yeah, with this, this and you do I, your own yeah. readings, right? Yes. Your your audio books are your own readings. See, I, yes, I, I stalk well, don't I? You do. <laughs> You're scary good. <laughs> I, I applaud so your stalking. That is, um, like that's, and that's got to be difficult. I think about. I very rarely do a podcast where it's me talking only. I prefer the. I prefer talking to people. I do um, too. But those rare podcasts where I'm just reading that, po you know, reading my script. First of all, I go off my own script. I'm the one who writes it and I go off script half the time. That's but good. it takes me 10 times as long to do that podcast, even though it's much shorter than an interview podcast. Because it's, I mean, you know what you, you're the one who wrote it. You know what, what you wrote, but your brain starts going off and your memories start coming back, right? And then, That's true. Yeah. It must be, in I don't know, it must be interesting to, to do an audio book. And then hearing, that's another thing. You have to get used to your own voice when you have a podcast, <laughs> yes. right? That's true. That's true. <laughs> Oy. Um, yeah, the, the audio book is, is a, it is a grueling process because it's, you know, a, a, an average book of, say, 300 pages is probably anywhere from five to eight finished hours. But that's, you're going to double or oh, triple, triple that in terms of recording it. Yeah. Wow. Lots of editing and all the rest of it. So it's just like, I would just get, my mouth would get sore. <laughs> <But> <laughs> yeah, we do like three hours at a time and I just get totally dried up and I go for a nap in the afternoon. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Understandably. <laughs>
Come back next week and listen to the conclusion of this incredible conversation with Natalie McLean. This has been another episode of Exploring the Wine Glass. Thanks for listening. If you have suggestions on what topics you would like me to discuss, please reach out on social media. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Exploring the Wine Glass. I am also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoytbud. Of course, you can always email me at exploringthewineglass at gmail.com. If you enjoyed what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe to help others find me more easily. And most importantly, tell your wine-loving friends, because if you like the podcast, they will too. Music is Wine by Kevens. Until next week, slancha. Give me the red, red wine. Give me the white, white wine. Give me the sweet, sweet wine. Give me the wine. Give me the wine. No, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. Never let you go. Oh, oh. No, no, no. Never let you go. Oh, no, no, no. I want to let you go. Now.